Welcome back to Simple Entomology for the Fly Tire and Fly Fisherman, Part 11. I'm Raj Kletke, and today we'll be starting our look at mayflies. Mayflies are the last of the common organisms that we'll be looking at in this series and are my favorite organism to use for fishing for trout. Mayflies are in the class Insecta and in the order Ephemeroptera. Terra, of course, refers to wings, and ephemeral means short-lived or fleeting. There are many families, genuses, and species of mayflies that do vary somewhat. I will generalize to keep this simple, so there will be exceptions to what I say. Mayflies undergo incomplete metamorphosis, so let's learn how to recognize the nymph. Like all insects, mayfly nymphs have three body parts and six legs. The thorax has wing pads and the abdomen has gills, although these may be difficult to recognize without magnification. Mayfly nymphs may have two or three tails. They come in varying sizes and shapes from quite robust to very flattened. The nymphs and larvae of most of the other organisms that we have discussed should not be a problem, but occasionally a stonefly nymph such as this may cause a problem. Remember the rule of twos that we discussed under stoneflies, and remember that stoneflies do not have abdominal gills. It is very interesting and of value to learn the varying mayfly nymph shapes, but that is more complex than I want to cover in this simple entomology series. Therefore, I do recommend this book on mayflies and this book on western mayfly hatches. This is particularly good even if you're from the East Coast or Midwest. And don't forget troutnut.com, an excellent resource that is available online. After emergence, the adult mayfly is easy to recognize by its upright wings. The forewing is large and may be mottled or quite plain. The hind wing may be obvious or so minute as to be virtually absent. While I referred to the mayfly after emergence as being an adult, in actual fact, it's immature. This immature form is known as a dun. The dun will undergo one more molt to become the sexually mature fly that we know as a spinner. The spinner can be easily recognized from the dun by its transparent wings. So when fishing with mayflies, we have to be aware not only of the mayfly nymph, near the bottom of the stream, but also its various stages as it emerges, as well as the emergent dun and the sexually mature form, the spinner. Especially with some species and on certain types of water, emergence can be a very difficult process, so we do need to tie flies for what are called cripples and stillborns also, as trout will key in on these forms. Therefore, the potential number of fly patterns that we might use to fish any mayfly hatch can appear quite numerous and overwhelming. However, not all mayfly species require all patterns, and this will appear a lot simpler after we tie mayflies. For now, just remember that we'll be fishing mayfly nymphs with slight variations and mayfly adults with slight variations. The easiest way to learn about and fish with mayflies is to simply ask at the fly shop. They'll tell you which mayflies are currently hatching, which patterns are currently useful, and we'll be happy to sell you these flies. If those flies work, take them home and use them as patterns for tying. Whether they use the common name or the scientific name, as long as you know where, when, what size, what stage to fish, you should be fine. I will commonly use a common name, for example, blue-winged olive, to include not only betas, betas complex, but some ephemerella, as long as they have slate gray wings and olive bodies, because these can all be fished very similar. If the mayfly requires a different mode of fishing, then I might use the scientific name. As we tie our flies, let's remember Hewitt's factors, as well as whether we are tying them for opportunistic feeding or selective feeding. 
A fly pattern that looks alive is the most important feature when trout are feeding opportunistically. I do commonly turn over rocks to see what mayfly nymphs are there for future reference, but the presence of a mayfly nymph at the bottom of a rock does not mean that it's in a drift and some other pattern may be a far better choice for trout feeding opportunistically. Mayfly nymphs do become active shortly before a hatch and therefore you may want some realistic appearing mayfly nymphs also. So let's tie a pheasant tail nymph which I think is one of the best imitative nymphs for numerous mayfly species. I'll use either a 1 or 2x long hook and start it the thread in the usual fashion, leaving a small amount of bear hook near the eye, keeping tension on the free end of the thread at about 45 degrees allows me to lay down a nice smooth base of thread on the hook. When I get to where I want to tie in the tail, I can break off the thread going parallel to the hook by pulling out the pheasant tail fibers at 90 degrees. It evens the tips of the fibers, and then I can put the length of tail I want at the intersection of the thread, and using thread tension will pull the fibers to the top. I then bring it forward towards the thorax, and then thin out the extra fibers. On a size 18, I may use only one fiber. On a size 16, I might use two and I vary it depending on how thick a body I want. I then bend those fibers back and put them loosely in place before I put in the fine copper rib. Again, you'll note that I'm tying it in place under the thorax, which will be a little thicker, and using very few thread wraps only to position the rib and the body material at the tail. I then use my rotary vise using the parallel technique to wind the body forward. I'll usually go a little past halfway, commonly about two-thirds of the length of the hook shaft, before I tie the body off. You'll note that even once I have the materials tied off, I put on about four or five extra wraps before either breaking or cutting off the pheasant tail fibers. The extra wraps unwind as I reverse wind the rib. You'll also note that I put the rib on the near side of the hook so that the first wrap goes under the hook. I think it looks a little neater this way. When I get to the tie-off point, my thread has unwound and I can now tie off the rib in the usual fashion. I like breaking the wire rib off rather than cutting it off and dulling my scissors. I then put the flashaboo on top because I like a flashback pheasant tail nymph for most of my fishing. Once this is in place, I can then use some peacock hurl. Again, on a size 18 or smaller, I may use only one. On a size 16, I'll probably use two strands. I cut them off even and then tie them into place. And I usually like to use the chenille method with my rotary vise because that provides some additional support to the peacock hurl. I usually put on quite a thick thorax because many mayfly nymphs have thick thora thoraxes, but also the peacock curl, once it gets wet, will thin out. I then tie that off. And again, cut or break that material off before bringing the flashaboo forward. I then tie off the flashaboo, being careful to keep a small amount of bare hook in front of my tie-off point for the flashaboo. You'll note that I like locking material in place by putting a couple of thread wraps in front of it also. 
At this point, all I need to do is add legs. I can put many materials on for legs. In this particular fly, I'm going to be using some additional pheasant tail fibers. I'll try to get them somewhat vertical, measure for length, and pinch them tightly to the far side of the hook using thread tension to bring these fibers underneath the hook. I then put a small head on, double whip finish, cut off the excess material, and I have my completed pheasant tail nymph. The next fly in line is a floating nymph, which is an early stage emerger. To tie the floating nymph, you simply start exactly as you did with the other pheasant tail nymph. You tie on the tail, the body material, the rib, you skip the flashaboo, put on a peacock curl thorax, and then as you can see here, I've added gray dubbing, which is a dry fly dubbing, to the thread. I've put, put it on in the usual fashion first, and now I'm using a vertical motion, which makes this into a ball of dubbing. If the ball is not the right size, you can either take dubbing away, or you can easily add more dubbing by starting it in the usual fashion around the thread and then do the vertical dubbing until you've created a ball of dubbing the size that you want. Once the dubbing ball is the size you want, you simply move your bobbin up above the hook and slide the dubbing ball down to the top of the hook. Pinch it in place and tie it off with a few wraps in front of the dubbing. If you want to, you can put some wraps behind the dubbing and even post up the dubbing by wrapping a few thread turns around the base. I'll occasionally do this in the larger nymphs, usually not in the smaller nymphs. At this point, if you want to, you can add legs in the same fashion that we did in the pheasant tail nymph. While I use legs in all of my regular pheasant tail nymphs, no matter what size, I usually do not bother with legs in my small floating nymphs. Break off the excess material or cut it off, add a small head, double whip finish, and you are done. For many mayfly species, one fly pattern will serve for many of the mid-stage emergers as well as the cripples and stillborns. This is the soft hackle fly, so let's tie a soft hackle fly. I usually tie these on a heavy hook, but I have the same tail, body, rib, and peacock thorax that I've used in the past. I'll pick a soft hackle. Usually I have to do a distribution wrap as the hackle would be too large otherwise. The easiest way to do a distribution wrap is to take your hackle feather, cut off the center stem, making a V shape, Keep the fibers somewhat vertical. You can either put them on the near side above the hook or on the far side slightly below the hook and pinch them tightly in place. Use your thread tension to wrap the feather and therefore all the fibers completely around the hook. Check to make sure you like the distribution. Redo it if necessary and then keep your thread tight while you either break off the excess fibers or cut off if necessary. Add a small head, double whip finish, and you have your completed soft hackle fly. The three flies that we've just tied can all be fished upstream in a dead drift fashion using an indicator, but there are other ways to successfully fish them also. In the next video, Mayflies Part 2, we'll tie some of the remaining patterns we need and discuss further how to successfully fish a mayfly hatch. See you soon.